Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start, at the very least, on my review of The Humans by Matt Haig, the Sunday Times bestseller. Uh, as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then we're going to go through and check out my tabs and share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. This is my first Matt Haig, so uh, pretty cool experience. Let's, let's dive on him. Dane reads. There's no place like home, or is there? After an incident one wet Friday night where he is found walking naked through the streets of Cambridge, Professor Andrew Martin is not feeling quite himself. Food sickens him, clothes confound him, even his loving wife and teenage son are repulsive to him. He feels lost amongst an alien species and hates everyone on the planet. Everyone, that is, except Newton, and he's a dog. Who is he really, and what could make someone change their mind about the human race? So yeah, basically he's an alien who's been sent to Earth to um, stop this mathematical discovery from, from getting out. And to begin with, it's kind of almost difficult to read, almost overwritten, because again, it's coming from the point of the view of this alien intelligence. So you get stuff like, uh, their manners and social customs too are a baffling enigma at first. Their conversation topics are very rarely the things they want to be talking about. And I could write 97 books on body shame and clothing etiquette before you could even get close to understanding them. And uh, this alien thinks that Emily Dickinson is the very best human poet. I don't know if I'd agree with that. She is good, probably not the best. So he picks up a Cosmopolitan magazine as a way of teaching himself to sort of read and understand their language and we get Indeed their chief purpose is to generate a sense of inferiority in the reader that consequently leads to them needing to buy something, which they do, and then feel even worse, and so need to buy another magazine to see what they can buy next. It is an eternal unhappy spiral that goes by the name of capitalism and it is really quite popular. So you do get these like really interesting insights. It, the mechanism of using an alien to see everything for the first time helps to show just how bizarre some of like Earth life is, you know? Let me get this line, uh, I knew Earth was a real event in a dull and distant solar system where not a great deal happened and where travel options for the locals were severely limited. I'd also heard that humans were a life form of, at best, middling intelligence and one prone to violence, deep sexual embarrassment, bad poetry and walking around in circles. Yep, that's us. So we get some stuff about book, a bookshop, he goes into a bookshop and I just thought this was really good. Um, Shops are beginning to open. In human towns, I would soon learn, everywhere is a shop. Shops are to earth dwellers what equation booths are to Vonadorians. In one such shop, I saw lots of books in the window. I was reminded that humans have to read books. They actually need to sit down and look at each word consecutively, and that takes time, lots of time. A human can't just swallow every book going, can't chew different tomes simultaneously, or gulp down near-infinite knowledge in a matter of seconds. They can't just pop a word capsule in their mouth like we can. Imagine! Being not only mortal, but also forced to take some of that precious and limited time and read. No wonder they were a species of primitives. By the time they had read enough books to actually reach a state of knowledge where they can do anything with it, they're dead. Understandably, a human needs to know what kind of book they're about to read. They need to know if it is a love story, or a murder story, or a story about aliens. There are other questions too that humans have in bookstores, such as, is it one of those books they read to feel clever, or one of those they will pretend never to have read in order to stay looking clever? Will it make them laugh or cry, or will it simply force them to stare out the window watching the tracks of raindrops? Is it a true story, or is it a false one? Is it the kind of story that will work on their brain, or one which aims for lower organs? Is it one of those books that ends up acquiring religious followers or getting burned by them? Is it a book about mathematics, or, like everything else in the universe, simply because of it? Yes, there are lots of questions, and even more books, so, so many. Humans in their typical human way have written far too many to get through. Reading is added to that great pile of things, work, love, sexual prowess, the words they didn't say when they really needed to say them, that they are bound to feel a bit dissatisfied about. So humans need to know about a book, just as they need to know when they apply for a job if it will cause them to lose their mind at the age of 59 and lead them to jump out of the office window, or if, when they go on a first date, the person who is now making witticisms about his year in Cambodia will one day leave her for a younger woman called Francesca who runs her own public relations firm and says Kafkaesque without ever having read Kafka. And here's his take on marriage. Marriage was a loving union which meant two people who loved each other stayed together forever. But that seemed to suggest that love was quite a weak force and needed marriage to bolster it. Also, the union could be broken with something called divorce, which meant there was, as far as I could see, very little point to it in logical terms. But then, I had no real idea what love was, even though it had been one of the most frequently used words in the magazine I'd read. It remained a mystery. Here's a very short chapter on mad people. Humans, as a rule, don't like mad people unless they are good at painting, and only then once they're dead. But the definition of mad on Earth seems to be very unclear and inconsistent. What is perfectly sane in one era turns out to be insane in another. The earliest humans walked around naked with no problem. Certain humans, in humid rainforests mainly, still do so. So we must conclude that madness is sometimes a question of time and sometimes a postcode. Basically, the key rule is, if you want to appear sane on Earth, you have to be in the right place, wearing the right clothes, saying the right things, and only stepping on the right kind of grass. And I just thought this was interesting. Obviously, I am team vegan. Uh, and here he gets, he, he uh, discovers beef. 
I was told to go to the dining hall to eat. This was a terrible experience. For one thing, it was the first time I'd been confronted with so many of their species in an enclosed area. Second, the smell of boiled carrot, of pea, of dead cow. A cow is an earth-dwelling animal, a domesticated and multi-purpose ungulate, which humans treat as a one-stop shop for food, liquid refreshment, fertilizer, and designer footwear. The humans farm it and cut its throat and then cut it up and package it and refrigerate it and sell it and cook it. By doing this, apparently they have earned the right to change its name to beef, which is the monosyllable furthest away from cow, because the last thing a human wants to think about when eating cow is an actual cow. I don't care about cows. If it had been my assignment to kill a cow, then I would have happily done so. But there was a leap to be made from not caring about someone to wanting to eat them. So I ate the vegetables. Or rather, I ate a single slice of boiled carrot. We get this great line. In this canteen, we're just one mute Native American away from a full cuckoo's nest. And obviously he's an alien, so he has no idea what she's talking about. So the alien guy goes, So love is about finding the right person to hurt you. And um, here we have this, this mathematical document I thought was interesting. Um, Prime was quite literally sent people insane, particularly as so many puzzles remain. They knew a prime was a whole number that could only be divided by one or itself, but after that they hit all kinds of problems. For instance, they knew that the total of all primes was precisely the same as the total of all numbers, as both were infinite. This was, for a human, a very puzzling fact, as surely there must be more numbers than prime numbers. So impossible was this to come to terms with, some people, on contemplating it, placed a gun into their mouth, pulled the trigger and blew their brains out. And we get a reference to uh, a Russian Grigory something who turned down some prize money. He gets referenced again later and explained a little bit more, but what was interesting is that I'd just been writing about him for a client. Uh, the, his son has got a copy of Ham on Rye by Charles Bukowski, excellent book. We get the line, to be a human is to state the obvious repeatedly over and over until the end of time. And he goes, listening to music I realised was simply the pleasure of counting without realising you were counting. And uh, that just reminds me, I told one of my friends that music is just maths, isn't it? So here we get um, that guy who gets mentioned. Uh, he turned it down and the million dollars that had gone with it. I'm not interested in money or fame, it said. I don't want to be on display like an animal in a zoo. I'm not a hero of mathematics. This was not the only prize had been offered. There had been others. A prestigious prize from the European Mathematical Society, one from the International Congress of Mathematicians in Madrid, and the Fields Medal, the highest award in mathematics. All of them he had turned down, choosing instead to live a life of poverty and unemployment, caring for his elderly mother. And this is kind of when the alien guy starts to realise that humans are more complicated than he first thought. He goes, human life, I realised, got progressively worse as you got older by the sound of things. You arrived with baby feet and hands in infinite happiness, and then the happiness slowly evaporated as your feet and hands grew bigger. And then from the teenage years onwards, happiness was something you could lose your grip of, and once it started to slip, it gained mass. It was as if the knowledge that it could slip was the thing that made it more difficult to hold, no matter how big your feet and hands were. We get a reference to Dawkins as uh, the selfish gene. We get a reference to the Emily Dawkins poem that goes, Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul, and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Which is where the book Hope is the thing with feathers comes from. And he observes, I have to admit that humans waste a lot of their time, almost all of it, with hypothetical stuff. I could be rich, I could be famous, I could have been hit by that bus, I could have been born with fewer moles and bigger breasts. I could have spent more of my youth learning foreign languages. They must exercise the conditional tense more than any other known life. You get a reference to social networking. On Earth, social networking generally involved sitting down at a non-sentient computer and typing words about needing a coffee and reading about other people needing a coffee while forgetting to actually make a coffee. Um, and also we get a hack taking place that isn't actually possible. Little note on love. Love is what the humans are all about, but they don't understand it. If they understood it, then it would disappear. All I know is that it's a frightening thing, and humans are very frightened of it, which is why they have quiz shows, to take their mind off it and think of something else. Love is scary because it pulls you in with an intense force, a supermassive black hole which looks like nothing from the outside, but from the inside challenges every reasonable thing you know. You lose yourself, like I lost myself, in the warmest of annihilations. It makes you do stupid things, things that defy all logic. The opting for anguish over calm, for mortality over eternity, and for earth over home. And another little observation, very true. The next day I had a hangover. I realised that if getting drunk was how people forgot they were mortal, then hangovers were how they remembered. And while I don't believe in God, I do like this little argument here and just the maths behind it all. You see, when you looked at a human's faith, you had to comprehend the look that brought that person here. Isabel Martin had a total of 150,000 generations before her, and that only includes the humans. That was 150,000 increasingly unlikely copulations resulting in increasingly unlikely children. That was a one in quadrillion chance multiplied by another quadrillion for every generation. Or around 20,000 times more than the number of the atoms in the universe. But even that was only the start of it, because humans had only been around for 3 million Earth years. Certainly a very short time compared to the 3.5 billion years since life first appeared on this planet. 
Therefore, mathematically, rounding things up, there was no chance at all that Isabel Martin could have existed. A zero in ten to the power of forever chance. And yet there she was in front of me, and I was quite taken aback by it all. I really was. Suddenly it made me realise why religion was such a big thing around here. Because yes, sure, God could not exist, but then neither could humans. So if they believed in themselves, the logic must go. Why not believe in something that was only a fraction more unlikely? Uh, Gulliver the Sun learns to play all apologies by Nirvana. Um, good song. And uh, he realises the point of love was to help you survive. The point was also to forget meaning, to stop looking and start living. The meaning was to hold the hand of someone you cared about and to live inside the present. Past and future were myths. The past was just the present that had died and the future would never exist anyway because by the time we got to the future, it would have turned into the present. The present was all there was. He says, the pub was an invention of humans living in England, designed as compensation for the fact that they were humans living in England. I rather liked the place. And uh, he sees a fr fruit machine, he says, I inquired about these machines. Apparently they were aimed at men whose fascination with flashing squares of light was coupled with a poor grasp of probability theory. And we have the ideal castle. I think this is very poignant. She said being human has been a young child on Christmas Day who receives an absolutely magnificent castle. And there is a perfect photograph of this castle on the box. And you want more than anything to play with the castle and the knights and the princesses because it looks like such a perfectly human world. But the only problem is that the castle isn't built. It's in tiny intricate pieces. And although there's a book of instructions, you don't understand it. And nor can your parents or Aunt Sylvie. So you're just left crying at the ideal castle on the box which no one would ever be able to build. And then towards the end we have a list of uh, rules that he puts out that I think are designed to be aimed, aimed towards his son. Uh, it just says advice for a human, but it is specifically written for his son. And I like these two here, 46 and 47. A paradox, the things you don't need to live, books, art, cinema, wine, and so on, are the things you need to live. And a cow is a cow, even if you call it beef. We get a quote from Graham Greene, the end of the affair, one can't love and do nothing. He's one of my favorite authors. And I just thought this was cool from the, the note and some acknowledgements. Um, because it's relatable to me as someone with anxiety. I first had the idea of writing this story in 2000 when I was in the grips of panic disorder. Back then, human life felt as strange for me as it does for the unnamed narrator. I was living in a state of intense but irrational fear that meant I couldn't even go to a shop on my own or anywhere without suffering a panic attack. The only thing I could do to gain a degree of calm was read. It was a breakdown of sorts, though as R.D. Lang and later Jerry Maguire famously said, breakdown is very often breakthrough and weirdly, I don't regret that personal hell now. I got better, reading helped, writing helped also. This is why I became a writer. I discovered the words and stories provided maps of sorts, ways of finding your way back to yourself. I truly believe in the power of fiction to save lives and minds for this reason. But it's taken me a lot of books to get to this one, the story I first wanted to tell. The one that attempted to look at the weird and often frightening beauty of being human. And yeah, The Humans by Matt Haig, very good. Um, I'm glad I picked this up as my first book of his, especially because I don't think it's necessarily one of his most well-known ones. It was a strong four out of five for me. As I say, sometimes reading from the perspective of the alien was a little disconcerting, so it was kind of a book that made you think. But as you can see from all the stuff I read out, I mean, it's almost philosophical at times. Um, beautifully written, even though, again, it is sometimes a struggle to read. I would recommend it. So there you have it, that's what I made of The Humans by Matt Haig. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.